Kirin, one of the very first Elder Dragons introduced in the franchise, all the way back in the original, and perhaps the ultimate counter to the heavy, slow weapons of the franchise. There are many questions I personally have about Kirin. For instance, how on earth it is classified as an Elder Dragon when we have a perfectly good herbivore grouping for ages. Kirin is perhaps one of the least imaginatively named creatures in Monster Hunter, to be honest. Rather than being some obscure reference to its inspirations or a portmanteau, all simply made up and sounding cool enough to suit the beauty in question, the inspiration for the creature was also used as its name. The Kirin, the legendary beast described throughout legends across East Asia. Well, it certainly makes for a somewhat refreshing change compared to the usual monsters I cover in these videos that require a bit of digging or outsider knowledge to pin down the inspiration. It's not just Kirin that we're going to be looking into today, however, because there's a second monster inspired by this legendary beast. And whilst it's in a game that very few Western players, I think, have played, it's notable to talk about either way. The Inagami, the bamboo-wielding elder dragon from Frontier. Two very different monsters, one predator and one ostensibly herbivorous, but both inspired by the same legend. So let's take a look. Kirin are true holy beasts. Joining the ranks of other beings such as the Huo and the Dragoners brings them immense prosperity and almost divine in themselves. They appear only in lands ruled by benevolent and wise rulers and are utterly peaceful. They refuse to eat the flesh of other beings and when they walk they do not crush so much as a single blade of grass or the smallest insects. The approach of such a creature indicates that the nation exists in a golden age. In Japan, these beasts stand above even phoenixes and dragons as the ultimate symbol of a divine creature. Whilst in China, they are merely the third greatest of all beasts. In terms of description, however, the Kirin is a curious chimeric mishmash of features. In China, where it is called the Qilin, it is often described with a dragon's head and a body not unlike an oxen or a horse and often covered in scales. Often they possess hair that flows like, or is quite literal, fire, and their voices sound like wind and bells. There is a huge number of slight variations in the Chilin across the millennia. Our earliest recording of one is from the 5th century BC, in fact. In Japan, the Chilin is similar, although Kirin is the more common name. Although in its depiction, it's more akin to a deer than an ox. Fascinatingly, the Kirin in its respective names is also used for giraffe in both China and Japan. An odd choice, perhaps, on the surface, but, but if you look at a giraffe with its reticulated pattern of coloration that so looks like a lizard's scales, the ossicone-like structures on their heads, well, I can certainly see a worse creature to compare them to, that's for certain. In more recent times, the Chilin has also come to be referred to by some as the Chinese unicorn, with some depictions showing them with a solitary horn only further linking the two. Seeing how both creatures are attributed great powers and are often associated with purity, I can see how the comparison could be made, though it's certainly one of the more curious cases of comparison between two very different mythological beasts. In looking at the Kirin and Inagami, let's first look at the morphologies. Despite being closely related, apparently, we have a number of similarities, but many strong differences. Both are scaled, just like their inspiration, although the thunder-wielding Kirin of Monster Hunter has a far more equine body when compared to Inagami, which is much stockier and decidedly draconic with its clawed feet and head. I suspect that the Kirin of Monster Hunter is more derived from the Japanese Kirin, whilst Inagami is far more based on the more draconic Chinese Chilin. Interestingly, both beasts share features when it comes to their fur, both having these rather distinctive beards for one, and these extremely tufty patches of fur that rise from the shoulders. In Kirin, this is attributed to the constant static electricity they produce, whilst Inagami simply has a good stylist, I suppose. They also have prominent fur rising from the back of their legs as well. Of course, the mythical Kirin is notable for its mane and fur that stand on end and flow almost like, or are made from, flame. This fur on both Kirin and Inagami is referring to this, and if you compare them to some depictions of the Kirin, especially that of the Mainlight series, 
you can see more direct inspiration in the tail, which is sometimes presented as a bushy, puffy mass. Whilst Inagami's predatory diet is something very contrary to the mythical Kirin, the mainline series version is far more in line with what we would expect from such a resplendent beast. In the Rise art book, we get some rather interesting insights from the researchers' notes that indicate Kirin lapping water from the surface of plants, which is further speculated to be broken down to create their electricity. Leaving aside the question about how Kirin successfully performs electrolysis to produce its lightning, this choice of diet is interesting in its correspondence with the mythical beast, said to consume no meat and harm no plant or animal. An observed diet of water harms nothing, and being but dew drops, the water would be considered pure in many religions as well, untainted by the various corruptions of the real world. Finally, and among the most important points for comparison in both monsters, is their history as bringers of fortune or protection in some manner. Mainline Kirin's armour across multiple games has given some manner of sacred protection skill, and in World it gave us the Great Luck skill, which increases the number of parts we get at the end of a hunt, or captures, depending on the grade. These are referred to straight up as being blessings, fittingly, although admittedly a good number of other Elder Dragon sets confer blessings upon the hunter of some variety. But things such as a bounteous harvest, Protection and fortune are all the sort of things one might wish for a divine beast to provide to you. Inagami, on the other hand, has an entire backstory dedicated to it, one that sits very much on the other end of the spectrum. Once upon a time, a village existed within its territory of the bamboo forest, and for centuries, apparently, monster and village coexisted peacefully. Considering the powers of Inagami to rapidly grow plants, especially for bamboo, the creature was regarded as sacred, and was rarely seen, it was venerated. Sounds somewhat familiar? A secretive divine beast with features like the Kirin that confers prosperity and bounty upon the land? Well, that certainly sounds like the mythical Kirin. Unfortunately, with time, the village grew greedy and stole some of Inagami's power and transferred it to a child... somehow. This part of the story seems a lot more fantastical than what Monsanto typically deals with, to be honest, but... As a result, the Inagami rage and destroy the village, with only the girls surviving to grow up into the songstress that we can meet in game. Either way, the Inagami once served much like the Kirin to a population of people, and whilst now it attacks hunters, we can see it as the predatory, betrayed version of the legend. And there we have it, how Kirin and Inagami are referring and directly inspired by the legendary Kirin and Chilin of myth. Kirin has always been a somewhat difficult monster for me. I like to play with the hunting horn, and this rapidly moving, lightning-calling beast has interrupted more than a few melodies on my part. Inagami is a personal favourite monster of mine, although unfortunately I've never been able to play Frontier. Someday, perhaps, we'll have it in the main series, but my hopes aren't high. For now, I've just got to content myself to listening to its theme, which is outstanding, by the way. But there we go. I hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, happy hunting, everyone!